So welcome to the Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association uh, live webinar uh, session. Uh, thanks for taking the time out today and joining us uh, via the link on our website under the events tab or on Facebook Live uh, or watching afterwards on our SCSA YouTube channel. <clears throat> if you're joining us for the first time, this is a live webinar which is held every Tuesday and Thursday at noon. Uh, they're recorded for their, the social media but the only ones being recorded are actually the four of us um, that you see here on your screen. To interact, ask questions, or add your experience, please type into the Q&A feature on Zoom or the chat on Facebook Live, and we'll be monitoring. <clears throat> and if we have a chance to, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, a chance to, we'll, go, we'll get to everyone's questions. Um, today's webinar is on construction considerations. It's an armchair series. What I'd like to do is uh, first, introduce the other panelists the people that are with us so um i guess we'll go in alphabetical order <laughs> and you guys can introduce yourself first name alphabetical hi my name is joanne and i'm an advisor here at the regina office and the regions that i work mainly in is moose john swift current as well as regina I'm Justin, Safety Advisor of Regina. Uh, my regions are Yorkton and Esterhazy, and I have just now realized that I'm not as good as my uh, doing my alphabetical order in my head as I thought I was, so I'll work on that from now on, Mike. Hey, Joanne and Justin, that's pretty tight, man. You have to go to the second letter. This is, this is like math. <laughs> okay, I'm Cindy Zorowski, and uh, Zorowski ends in Z, so... I'm often last <laughs> without thought. <laughs> I'm an advisor yeah. at a Regina office. So, so today you get it. today you get to go last based off your first name. So yeah, that's yeah. unusual. Thanks, thanks guys. Um, Joanne, you would you would you mind sharing your screen with everyone? And I will. Uh, we're going to go through a short PowerPoint here. So this series of uh, webinars that we're doing is, uh, is tailored for the professional and the DIYer alike. And if, you, if, if you're considering doing some construction, then please consider these considerations. Uh, I'll be starting off the presentation and we'll be joined by the rest of the group uh, once I'm done the, the short PowerPoint. Um, and we'll have a, a short discussion and look at some things. Uh, today's recording and previous sessions can be accessed anytime for our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Okay, so let's get into this. Today we're going to talk about welding um, and some of the hazards found when working with welders or welding or around them because this is one of the uh, actual trades that affects the people around us sometimes as much as it affects the person doing the work. Um, this is a real passion of mine as I spent more than half my career in the welding uh, trade, earning my Red Seal Journeyman Certificate in 2004. Uh, due to COVID-19, people are finding more time to renovate their homes, hire contractors to do these renovations. Uh, hardware stores are seeing an increase in sales. Uh, and the th same thing with projects. People are taking on projects, fixing trailers, doing uh, work around the house uh, like they haven't before, considering um, you know, the get extra time we have on our hands. Welding uh, involves intense heat, high electrical current, dangerous fumes, and very bright light. So training and procedures and safety is very important. Uh, but if done correctly, it should not shorten one's life. Uh, protection for those welding and others in the vicinity should be top of mind at all times. So I just wanted to go through some common welding processes. Um, in the next slide, I have here uh, some common welding machines. There's the MIG welder on the left there, a little bit of the TIG welding in the middle, and then uh, an arc or possibly an arc and a TIG uh, a welder on the right hand side. No matter what process we're using for welding, um, there's always going to be high heat. There's always going to be a bright light. Sometimes you can use a process that has a flux that's getting deposited over the arc. And typically that's in a professional shop. 
something like that. So, uh, and there isn't a lot of Bright Lake because it's, it's covered by the flux. Uh, but for a homeowner or a construction worker, typically we're going to be looking at one of these processes. Um, so let's, let's move on through the PowerPoint and talk about some things. One of the common things we'll see in a MIG operation when we're, when we're using a wire feed uh, system or we're using uh, cutting torches with oxyacetylene fuel, um, even brazing, stuff like that, even using um, propane. What we'll see is, is compressed gases uh, is a need for those operations. Now, this isn't something to be taken lightly uh, considering the high pressure of these compressed gases. Um, it's, it could be well over 2000 PSI. And what we have is we have a vulnerable situation with the, uh, with the top of the bottles, typically where the valve is, where you turn the, it on and off. That is protected, as you see in the bottom left picture, by a cap when the bottle's not being used. But once you, once you put a regulator on it, uh, on the bottle or whatever, now you have a situation where possibly uh, you have a shear point there if the bottle was to fall over any of that. Um, you use acetylene uh, for welding or use of a cutting torch. It's highly flammable. Um, we have MIG mix uh, bottles that have a combination of say argon and CO2 uh, like a C2, C25 gas, it, it has over 25 or over 2000 PSI in that bottle. Uh, we can use all kinds of shielding gases like argon, helium, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, or a combination of, of, of them. I want to go through a little story that I had. I, I was working in a shop once and our process in the shop, they had a procedure for, I was building a drilling rig at the time and it was a mud tank. And the procedure for, for this operation to, was to get the MIG welder up on top of the, mel, the, MIG, uh, the mud tank with the crane the, inside the shop. Well, the problem was is there was no hooks welded onto this MIG cart. And the MIG cart held uh, kind of the, the MIG welder and it held the bottles as well. It had a, a bottle and then a spare bottle. I believe it had two bottles on the back side of this, this cart. So they said, well, you just... The process was you just put the slings underneath the cart and it balances and you lift it up and you get it up to the eight or nine or 10 feet that you needed to get it up and then bring it onto the, onto the mud tank because the whip that comes off the MIG welder to actually weld with was only 10 feet long. So obviously if you're going up 10 feet, you wouldn't be able to weld like the grating, for example, on the mud tank unless you bring the machine right up there. Uh, I went to the foreman and this, I was pretty early in my career and I went to the foreman and, uh, and I talked to him and I said, like, this doesn't seem very safe. I got a, it's just balancing. Like, what if it goes off balance and it's above my head I said, I'm not going to be able to get out of the way or, or I'm not going to be able to hold this thing. It weighs, I don't even know each one of these bottles weighs a couple hundred pounds. So it's just too much. And, and it doesn't make sense for me to be getting under a suspended load. Uh, he said, no, 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 don't, uh, don't worry about it. This is what we do. This is what we've always done. <laughs> and then I, so I went to the shop foreman. So one above him and I said, look, this is crazy. Why don't you give me like a half an hour, whatever it takes. I'll, I'll cut some flat bar. I'll create some hooks on this, on the MIG cart. And then we can just hook it up, grab onto the hook. I'll balance it and we'll bring it up on the thing. No, no, no. We've done it this way forever. So this is kind of, this is kind of crazy. Uh, but I, I moved forward through it. Um, at the time, I didn't know about my right to re actually legit refuse that work, even though at the time it didn't seem like it, it would have got me very far. Uh, it still would have been uh, probably the right thing to do. Well, absolutely the right thing to do. So what I did was I balanced it underneath the cart, the way that the exact way you had to put one strap right in front of the back wheel and one strap right behind the front wheel. I lifted it up, it got just above my head and like I had predicted almost like I had foreshadowed into the future, the bottle starts tipping backwards towards me. Um, like I had said, I got out of the way because there's no way I'm gonna be able to catch 400 pounds of machine <laughs> before it hits the ground. So I die, if I run, the bottle tips upside down, knocks the, the regulator off the bottle 
And I've heard of these, these compressed gas uh, bottles going through concrete, center concrete block walls and witnessed that day the actual violence of a compressed gas cylinder uh, that is now like trying to, ex trying to get all of the gas out of there as, as fast as possible. So it's spinning on the ground, this, this cylinder. People are diving out of the way. People are climbing up ladders, trying the best to get out of the way. The owners are looking through the windows that overlook the shop. And what happened is that this thing actually slammed up against a pillar in the shop and was, was uh, it extinguished there. And it was a very dangerous situation actually. So this stuff's not to be taken lightly. What I had actually should have done was refuse the work. And if I decided that I actually thought this was safe and I was gonna go overhead with it, I should have taken the regulator off and put the cap on that bottle. And even on that point, at the end of each day, like these regulators, they have flashback arresters. There are safety components on them so that you don't get a flashback that comes back through the, the hose. What will happen is one of the bottles will go empty and the gas will actually travel back through the hose and it could get into, it could end up wrecking components of your system or get back into one of the compressed gas bottles. Um, and you don't want that. So they actually created a flashback arrestor that'll go on your regulator and they'll, they actually have them for, for your torches as well so you can't if there's a flashback back through the torch it'll stop that flame from traveling down that line uh, uh, it's mandatory just to have those it's, maybe at one point it was a good time across the board we got to put those things on on the regulators at a minimum uh, at the end of the day something else I've learned from the welding train is that at the end of the day we take those we take those regulators uh, actually off of the the uh, bottles and put the caps back on the bottles. Um, such as storing propane inside of a shop is dangerous. Um, also, leaving a regulator on a bottle, if there was a slow leak of acetylene, for example, in a small shop or in a small area or whatever, and you went in there and turned a light on and it ignited that propane and there was such a mixture that the mixture had got above the lower explosive limit, you could actually have a, a whole shop explosion. Uh, due to an acetylene leak overnight, especially if you didn't turn the bottle off or if there was a, a malfunction in the, in the uh, um, valve. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Quickly on eye hazards. Uh, there's a lot of eye hazards and I will talk about this when I get to uh, talking about UV and that um, one of the things is the, the radiation emitted from the bright light. But besides that, there's a lot of uh, eye hazards associated to the welding trade. There's going to be a few things that go on that's typical of welding. One's going to be grinding. When you're grinding, you're throwing sparks uh, everywhere. They go up, down, and around, and they bounce off of things, and they're very hot. Um, I've had to get uh, metal taken out of my eye in the past, and one of the experiences I had, this is the worst experience, typically... Uh, well, not typically, but sometimes you can blink them out or or whatever, but there's a caution in that and with doing any procedure with your eyes on your own, because what'll happen is you can actually scratch your eyeball with, even with blinking and stuff like that, use eye wash stations, do all that stuff. But if you can't get it out, let's say a spark goes in your eye and it and it actually melts to your eye or gets embedded in your eye. I've gone through this procedure where you go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, God, I've seen this before because it's, it's, it's kind of typical because of the, the nature of the sparks bouncing and stuff. He put my head in a chin rest, froze my eyeball, took two needles and went looking through like a magnifying glass kind of thing. And it looked like two needles. I don't know what they were, scrapers or, you know, I don't know. I don't know the technical term for, that they use. But they get in there and they actually have to dig and scrape and make sure they get all of that metal right out of your eye. And, and you're not put down, like not put down. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is you're not sleeping. You are actually wide awake. You just have a frozen eyeball and you're staring straight ahead and you're watching these things come in. It's kind of like a horror movie. It's something that I, 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 don't, uh, I don't like and I don't like going through. And we're going to talk about how to prevent those kind of things besides not shooting sparks at your face how to prevent these things in our PPE section of this. And when we discuss some PPE, because there's some common things that need to need to happen that can really help. Um, dust, debris, 
uh, slag from welding. They're always chipping slag. You're using a wire wheel on the grinder uh, to buff your welds or to clean the steel. There is stuff going everywhere uh, through the whole process of grinding, buffing, welding. Uh, there's sparks flying everywhere. So what I like to do is now go to the next one. And what we're gonna talk about is some UV stuff. Um, I had to actually, I took some stuff off the, the interwide web that I'd like to go through with you because this is a, a really interesting information. And I didn't, you know, sometimes throwing the words together from the gut is not necessarily as good as, as some good uh, solid information. Uh, radiation is emitted by welding arc in three principal range, uh, ranges. So basically, um, we get infrared, uh, uh, ultraviolet, and that. And you can actually get arc eye or welder's flash from a process. Like you see this, I put an X next to this picture in the bottom left. For a couple of reasons, this is not good. For one, um, there's the PPE being used is, is absolutely not even in existence, basically. A pair of sunglasses is not uh, what you want to use for, for any application in any construction. Sunglasses just are not the, the deal. You can, get, you can get shaded safety glasses. And I don't even know what that other worker has yet, has a cloth over their face, some sunglasses on, and they're welding. Um, I want to talk about Archive for a little bit. Uh, Archive is caused by UV radiation. This damages the utmost protective layer of cells in the cornea. Gradually, the damaged cells die and fall off the cornea, exposing highly sensitive nerves in the underlying cornea of the comparatively rough inner part of the eyelid. This causes intense pain usually described as sand in the eye. And that is exactly what it feels like. It's like someone has dumped like fine sand right in your eye. Every time you blink, every time that your eye is closed because bright light really is sensitive to bright light and stuff like that. When your eyeball moves underneath your eyelid, it's like sand is under your eyelid and, and scratching your eye. Um, the pain becomes even more acute if the eye is then exposed to bright light. Arc eye develops some hours after exposure, which may not even even have been noticed, and I've, that is absolutely true. The sand in the eye symptom and pain usually last for 12 to 24 hours, but can be longer and, and in more severe cases. Unfortunately, arc eye is, is almost always a temporary, fortunately, arc eye is almost always a temporary condition in the unlikely event of prolonged and frequently repeated exposures, permanent damage can occur. A person would have to be to have to be stubborn and or foolish to allow himself to repeatedly expose to such arc eye risks without taking some precautions. Treatment of arc eye is simple. Rest in a dark room, various soothing uh, anesthetic eye drops can be administered by a qualified person or a hospital casualty department. These can provide almost instantaneous relief. Um, Ultraviolet effects upon the skin. I have a story uh, in relation to a couple of these items as well. The UV from arc processes does not produce uh, the browning effect of a sunburn. But does, so this is not a good way to get a tan in the winter. Uh, but does cause reddening and irritation caused uh, by changes in the, the minute surface blood vessels. In extreme cases, the skin may be severely burnt and blisters may form. The reddened skin may die and flake off in a day or so. Uh, where there's been intense prolonged or frequent exposure, skin cancers can develop, but there's little evidence in, of this in welders, uh, probably because welders protect themselves. Um, when I first got into the welding trade, I was a welder's helper and I was pipelining. And one of the first things I did was we were, when we're welding on the pipeline, you're welding like, like 48 inch pipe. I remember we were welding out in the middle of uh, uh, a field essentially on a right away and I got a we have a welder on one side and a welder on one side so you're doing two sides of the pipe at once and you have a couple of uh, helpers that that pass the grinder pass the buffer do some things around there and pass welding rods well so the helpers usually just down there and chat with each other well the welders are actually conducting the the weld which takes it could take all day to do half of the weld even so standing there hat passing rods and i'm not wearing safety glasses and i'm not really protected because it's hot out so i, I think i was wearing t-shirt and i'm just passing welding rods but that 
and I and I'm actually taking kind of like the the gentleman in the the bottom left picture. I'm kind of I'm not looking at the weld because I'm not silly. I'm not just going to stare at a weld. Um, so I'm looking away, but I can see it in my peripherals. Man, at the end of uh, at the end of doing some work, I can't remember if it was the first day, second day, irregardless. My skin was burnt like really bad. My eyes were. I had arc eye. Um, I had to take the next day off work. And I was in excruciating pain. Um, not to be fooled with, actually. This is not. This is one of the the big hazards of welding. And so, if you see in the bottom right picture, what is this? This this uh, curtain style thing is actually a design for a welding shop or in any area that you can protect your coworkers or passerbyers by the 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 bright light caused from any welding or cutting application. Uh, if you if you start getting into doing uh, started talking about cutting, you start getting into doing some plasma arc cutting, stuff like that. You have intense rays, the same as you would out of uh, welding with uh, with an arc welder. Um, although there are different effects from UV, visible, and infrared radiation, there is one common protection mechanism that is completely effective. This is to provide a barrier to prevent the radiation reaching sensitive surfaces. The welder should therefore be equipped with protective equipment such as indicated, uh, like what I was talking about, and also safety glasses. You got all of your, your letters, which I'll talk about. I'll... It should not be forgotten that radiation can be reflected off shiny surfaces, and several cases of arc eye attributed to unwanted reflections that have been recorded. The walls, etc., cetera, for the work area should have a matte finish. You can also use such things as welding blankets and that to protect other workers, uh, but such things as the shop that I'm in right now, very white, bright white walls to reflect light and they do a very good job. Um, okay, I wanna move on to talking about air quality. One of the other huge hazards in welding is the, uh, is, look at the welder in that picture. This is not uncommon, this is not special, this is not, oh, okay, he's, this is not a joke. This is not extreme. This is practical, what it looks like when you're welding. And let me tell you, the welder that's welding there is not going to be welding for one minute and then stop welding and go and do something else for the rest of the day. There's going to be re uh, repetitive clouds of smoke that come up, a constant cloud of smoke, actually. Now, is that matter? Uh, overexposure to welding fumes and gases can cause severe health problems. Uh, like respiratory illness, cancer, and impaired speech and movement. Exposure to fumes and gases can be controlled um, by, following the, the fo by following safety precautions. So how do I reduce exposure to welding fume? Welders should understand the hazards of the materials they're working with. Information and training for workers on hazardous materials in the workplace uh, should be provided before any uh, process is actually uh, undertaken. Welding surfaces should be cleaned of any coating that could potentially create toxic exposure, such as solvent residue and paint. Um, when, we, when we talk about uh, welding, a lot of people may think, okay, well, it's all new, brand new steel, it's all, and, that, and that's, that's one thing. And, and there is still inherent hazards in, in welding brand new clean steel, like the welding electrode that you have and the flux that's involved and some of the properties that's within that welding material. Um, when I get into dirty steel, painted, solvents, grease, oil, that kind of stuff, now we're introducing other things that were never designed to be inhaled, were never designed to be burnt, can cause fires, can cause all kinds of health problems as well. Uh, workers should, uh, should position themselves to avoid breathing welding fumes and gases. For example, welders should stay upwind when welding in open or outdoor environments. General ventilation, it, the natural or forced movement of fresh air can reduce fume and gas levels in a work area. Welding outdoors or in open work spaces does not guarantee ad adequate ventilation. In work areas without ventilation and exhaust systems, welders should use natural drafts along with proper position to keep fume and gases away from themselves and from other workers. Um, local exhaust ventilation systems can be used to remove, remove fume, and gases uh, from the welder's breathing zone. Keep fume hoods, fume extractor guns, and vacuum nozzles close to the plume source 
to re remove the the maximum amount of fuming gases. So this was gonna gonna be like a, a an actual uh, suction where you can put it down by your work area and it's gonna suck the the smoke out. And either it's gonna be filtered and and put back uh, into the the area, or it's gonna be put right outside into a uh, and keep the air as fresh as possible inside. Portable or flexible exhaust systems can be positioned so that the fume and gases are drawn away from the welder, uh, keep exhaust ports away from other workers, obviously. Consider substituting a lower volume generating or less toxic welding type uh, or consumable. Do not weld in confined spaces without ventilation. Uh, general rule of the thumb, if you're gonna be in a confined space, no matter what that confined space is, ventilate, ventilate, ventilate. Uh, respiratory uh, protection may be required if work practices and ventilation do not reduce exposures to safe levels. Uh, such things as air purifying respirators, uh, supplied air respirators, things like this can be used when you're going to be in a confined space or you're in an area where, where the smoke is just, you can't get away from it. Um, So factors that affect worker exposure to welding fumes, the type of the welding process, the base metal and, and filler metals being used, the welding rod composition, the location, so are you outside in closed space, that kind of stuff, the welder's work practices. There is like, it, like the work positioning, stuff like that, that really try to get your face out of that smoke. Uh, air movement and use of ventilation controls. Um, so what about some of these types of steel that you're welding? And, and this comes down, this is the science of it and this is the actual addressing the details. Uh, what about galvanized steel? People have, a lot of people have heard about uh, zinc oxide poisoning or galvanized poison. Uh, and it's caused when a person is overexposed to the zinc oxide uh, in a galvanized steel uh, formed when the galvanized coating on steel evaporates at a very high temperature. Uh, such as the temperatures needed for welding. Severe cases will align with symptoms of the flu-like chills, cold sweats, vomiting, fever, and shaking. And again, I have experienced this in real life. Uh, uh, when you're welding galvanized steel, it's very important to stay out of the welding smoke. Um, if need be, wear proper respiratory protection for sure. What about stainless steel? It contains nickel and chromium, which can cause asthma. Nickel and chromium, uh, can be actually very they're, they're cancerous when they, when it's in the in the airborne kind of thing so prolonged exposure to welding fume may cause lung damage and various types of cancer including lung larynx and urinary tract uh cancers health effects from certain fumes may include middle fume fever stomach ulcers kidney damage and nervous system uh damage stay out of the smoke wear proper ppe there may many air quality issues with welding it's as simple as that uh, grinding and wire wheeling can also produce airborne contaminations, contaminants. Okay, let's talk about some PPE. Here's a, a, a person that's all, all garbed up in some PPE. I can't imagine on a day like today, plus 30, uh, actually I can't imagine what it's like being in the hot sun all outfitted up. I just can't imagine being completely outfitted up because uh, I usually put on appropriate gear. This is this this gentleman or this uh, worker uh, is fully garbed out. So let's talk about PPE. Uh, the first line of defense, obviously, is going to be your brain. Uh, this is good decision making. This is judgment and ex execution. This is you know I have an option for some PPE and I decide not to. <laughs> right. That so your first form of personal protective equipment is going to be your brain. Now let's talk about some of the other basic PPEs that we're gonna use. Um, we could have a high top leather boot. Now in my shop, uh, Joanne, let's kick out of the PowerPoint actually and talk about some of this PPE because I have some kicking around. I'm just gonna pull my, my, my work shoe off here. I have a, a, a work shoe here. This is, not, this is good for working in the shop, doing some utility work or, or maybe I'm doing some electrical or whatever. It's a CSA approved work boot. It's fantastic. Um, the only thing is, if I'm going to be using this with welding, there's a high potential for welding sparks and that to get into the boot in a lot and sit against the ankle and you really get some. If it's a if it's a molten slag that drips off a of weld and into your boot, you have a severe pinpoint uh, burn going on and it just keeps burning. <laughs> That's the problem with welding slag. 
is it sticks. It, it hits your skin. It sticks to the skin. It keeps burning. Or it, 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 if uh, if it goes through your clothes, let's talk about like welding slag dripping going through clothes. Uh, if I'm not wearing proper, I would say stick with cotton or wool clothing, whether it's pants, uh, jeans work good. Uh, clothing for your shirts. I wear typically welding. I'll wear a couple of long sleeve cotton shirts. Uh, the reason I don't go to the polyesters or some of these synthetics is that that welding slag is bad enough on its own, but you start getting that and it starts carrying some of the plastics and the rubbers and the whatever else is in these synthetic fibers. It'll, it'll carry that with it as it burns through your shirt and onto your arm. And now it's burning with, with some sort of, you almost have like a grease fire on your arm. Um, so it, it really just sticks to the skin, uh, not to mention you're using cutting torches, stuff like that, uh, where if you do run across the skin with a cutting torch or the arm or whatever, you wouldn't want to be melting a synthetic fiber to your, to your arm or your leg. I had this once where I was using a cutting torch and I was spinning a tank on a, uh, it was on a turntable, but the turntable was probably the diameter of the turntable was I don't even know what it was, 20 feet, 30 feet. It was huge. We were building some huge tanks. And I was welding the floor on. So you set a, a wall section on the floor. And then you, you spin it and you weld as you're going. And this actually, I wasn't welding. I was cutting the floor off. There was a problem. So I had to do some cutting. So I'm cutting the floor off. So I'm actually spinning the turntable as I'm cutting. And the torch got grabbed by the turntable. And it pulled it out of my hand, which was less than awesome. And the torch fell onto my leg. And I, I don't know what the degree of that torch is. I think they get, they get hot. And it, it went through my, my fire resistant or fire retardant coveralls, through my jeans, and onto my leg almost immediately. And I had like first, second, and third degree burns. It depends how close to the localized area it was on my leg. Pretty scary situation. Um, in that case, that worker that you've seen in the picture in the PowerPoint, is not over garbed. They have uh, they have the leather pants on, leather apron. You can get. I have such things as uh, here's a leather boot protector. Oh, let's go back. To actually, stay in the shop here, Joanne, please. I have a a leather boot protector here, and this is actually would go over my my boot like this, and wrap around here, and that'll keep sparks out of my boot if I'm going to be. Uh, if I'm worried about maybe I'm using a cutting torch and I'm throwing sparks at my legs, stuff like that. Um, so that's a really good thing to keep that out. I have a leather jacket here. This is a heavy leather jacket. Works extremely well for when you're throwing sparks or when you're welding. Because when you're welding, um, like you can't get around it. A lot of times you're doing overhead welding or, or welding the vertical or horizontal. And you're going to have slag that's dropping down. You're gonna have a lot of hot sparks and cutting as well. You're gonna get a lot of sparks flying back at you. Uh, a welding jacket, a good investment is a, is a welding jacket that you can wear and you can really keep that stuff off uh, from burning your skin. Another thing is, is here's just a sleeve actually. This is a, a really neat uh, little thing. So it's not so hot as the jacket. You put this over top and now I can do some welding or some cutting or whatever and I can protect this arm. Maybe I'm, I'm using a certain application where I have a lot of sparks generated that are coming back at my arm and my cotton t-shirts, which will take care of general sparks and stuff like that, like sparks from grinding, that kind of stuff. They, they get absorbed in the cotton and go out. Uh, this will actually protect me from some heavier sparks or if, if I have uh, a lot of heat generated right in this area here from, from welding, then I, this will actually protect my arm so I'm not melting my clothes that kind of stuff. And I have seen the heat generated get so hot that you'll, you'll, uh, you'll actually shrink a pair of gloves up. Um, when it comes to gloves, what are we talking about? Here's a, uh, some interesting gloves. These gloves, I can't remember where I bought these, but I bought them basically just for handling steel in a, in a quick fashion, whatever, but it's a, essentially like a welding blanket and it's sewn into a glove. Uh, not very practical for actually welding with and stuff, more for maybe handling some hot steel. Uh, what I have here is, is uh, more conducive to what I'm talking about with a, with a welding glove. Now it's a gauntlet style glove so that you don't get, you have more protection up your sleeve, which when you're welding, you have a lot of heat generated in this area. I'm right-handed, so I have a lot of heat generated here and a lot of heat generated with my, with my left hand. 
holding steel or being near stuff. Something to remember with gloves is to always remember uh, and assume that everything you touch is hot. Because if you don't, eventually you're going to be, you know, you're touching things, you're grabbing things that are extremely hot and that can just instantly melt your finger kind of thing and get you some severe burns. So assume everything is hot in the welding operation, wear a proper gauntlet or a proper leather glove and protect your hands from, from all of those things. Um, talk about welding blankets. This is a welding blanket here. If I was going to be throwing sparks in my shop and I wanted to protect something, I can use this to protect uh, an item in my shop or something like that, or uh, even other coworkers. If I was working in here with, uh, with another worker and I wanted to just pre prevent, put a barrier up that really does that. Maybe I want to protect a certain side of my shop from throwing sparks. Maybe I have some wood uh, stored in an area of the shop or whatever. I can take a welding blanket. I bought this welding blanket just recently, actually, because it was on sale. It's not that expensive. It's a four by six uh, foot welding blanket. Um, great investment for any welding operation. You can even put it down. A lot of people use welding blankets to protect items in the welding area. If I throw sparks at glass, for example, you'll just pit your glass right out. If I'm on a site, like a commercial site, and I'm doing some some uh, stair railing or I'm putting installing stairs or doing some clips for electricians or whatever kind of work in these areas there's a lot of finished product there's finished uh, there's finished areas there's paint there's glass there's a lot of stuff going on a welding blanket is invaluable the last thing you ever want to do is be welding above people or above things that that are sensitive to sparks and not put down something like this it can be very costly uh, and and it, it's very avoidable. So you put down a welding blanket, it'll absorb those sparks and they have a chance to actually uh, to, to cool off on the blanket. Uh, for example, even this thing, I have a chop saw here. This chop saw, if I was gonna cut this piece of rebar, which I know is very hard to see on your screen, but if I'm gonna cut this piece of rebar using this chop saw, this is an abrasive disc chop saw. It throws a ton of sparks. When I get this set up in my shop, behind this, I, I will hang this, this uh, welding blanket up and it'll protect my wall. It'll protect the surfaces around from those, those high heat sparks. So very versatile, very good piece of, I don't know if it's necessarily PPE, but it's, it's along the lines of protecting equipment and material and other people. So um, what else do we want? The, like I say, the high top boot is a good idea so you don't get those sparks in there. Uh, CSA approved safety glasses. Okay, so these glasses, it's safe for me to wear a pair of these safety glasses for one reason, and that's so I can see what I'm doing. I don't happen to be that blind, I guess, that I can't get away with wearing a pair of glasses like this. Now I can buy a pair of CSA approved safety glasses that have my prescription in them. So anyone that, or you can even wear a pair of overs over top. Now this gets me into a very interesting point and it's very, uh, it's very apt for, for the welding trade is the idea of dual protection. So dual eye protection. Safety glasses in the welding trade are working around welders in an area, that kind of stuff. Safety glasses are an essential at all times. You never take them off. They're, they're essential at all times. Whether I'm working, if I'm working around someone, very unpredictable on those sparks. They could fly 10, 15 feet away uh, just by grinding. Um, not to mention these things, uh, if I'm not wearing them at all times, at some points I may just uh, be vulnerable to my own processes. Dual protection looks like this. I have a pair of safety glasses on. That's one layer of protection. I grab my uh, <laughs> my headphones. Obviously, I wouldn't be wearing, but I'd wear a clean face shield over top when I was using uh, such things as this or even a grinding or buffing. There, if nothing else, you're, you're giving your eyes a pretty good shot at net, not getting anything in them. If I'm wearing dual protection, if I'm grinding, buffing, cutting that kind of stuff but the other aspect of it is just the inconvenience of sparks hitting your face and chunks of steel and stuff like that smoking you in the face is not comfortable it's not good um so dual protection is really good and they make this stuff that is compatible with actually hard hat as well such things as this welding helmet i have a welding helmet here compatible with a hard hat. So if hard hats are mandatory on my work site, if I'm in a work site in construction and I'm working on a commercial project and they're like hard hats are 100% mandatory in that setting, then 
I get a combo helmet. Okay, a combo helmet has that dual layer of protection. I'm still wearing my safety glasses at all times, guys. I'm welding. I can lift my, I can flip my, my, my screen up because this has my welding screen inside of it. I can flip that up and now I can do some grinding, buffing, that kind of stuff. And I have that layer of protection here as well. Um, the combo helmets can be swapped out for a face shield as well. They make this with this quick connect. So I can just pop this off here. And my welding helmet, my welding helmets here, I take that off and I can put a face shield over top of it as well. Um, well, I'm talking about face shields and hard hat or helmets, uh, I will continue. Here is a really good solution or a good option for doing cutting. So if I'm gonna be uh, doing some cutting operations, maybe with uh, a um, cutting torch, like an oxyacetylene cutting torch, if I'm gonna be doing some brazing or some, uh, some welding with that oxyacetylene welding, uh, an option like this is really great with a tinted screen in it. Now, if this is still too bright, it depends on the shade of this screen. If that's still too bright for that operation, what you can do is you can use that in combination with a tinted safety glass. And the two combinations will actually bring that shade down to something that's more comfortable, not going to create any damage to your eyes and not going to strain your eyes. So uh, a, a tinted face shield is also a really good thing because now if I'm cutting, opposed to just wearing goggles, because you can get uh, cutting goggles, they give you a full seal around your eye and stuff like that, which is essentially kind of like this, a little darker, um, and it's going to give you that so you can comfortably look at the cutting operation uh, using oxycetylene. Uh, the only problem with that is the sparks still fly back in your eyes. This is so nice or back in your face, I should say. This is so nice to have some like this to protect your whole face from that uh, situation. Okay, I think that's all I wanna talk about with those uh, welding helmets. I also, with welding helmets, I guess another piece of PPE, another aspect is uh, a, um, and Joanne, you can leave it on the PowerPoint, is actually a your welding helmet. They make some that are quick tint or uh, they auto, auto tint, so I, I could be, they have settings in them that I can wear one helmet and I can do my grinding with it and I can do my welding with it. And when I strike an arc, it goes from something I can see through to down to a dark tint where I can uh, weld and I, I get no arc flash out of it. So really good piece of PPE. They make hoods for welding as well. Instead of the hel welding uh, your face shield, they'll make a hood that's a fabric hood that you can put over your head to get into tight spots. And I've used that in the past as well. Pretty neat piece of the leather hood that goes over your neck uh, and your head. Uh, fire tonic coveralls, like I already said, is a really good idea. Welding cap or bandana. Now, when it comes, maybe Joanne, I'll get you to go back to, to the shop here. Um, when it comes to wearing a welding cap, and everyone's seen them, or a lot of people have seen them, where it's the, the cap with a little brim on it, hey? That little brim is, it, it, it can do a couple of things. It can protect your neck, the back of your neck with the little brim because you wear it backwards a lot of times and it keeps the sparks from hitting you in the head too as well, which is kind of nice. And I, I used a bandana a lot just to keep those sparks off my head and stuff like that. It was really nice. The welding caps are really specially designed for, for protecting your neck or protecting even better, protecting your ear. Um, typically I had ear protection in so I wouldn't get a spark down into my ear canal. But uh, getting a spark in the ear canal is, it, for one, it's, it's dangerous. It could affect your, uh, your eardrum, uh, that kind of stuff. It could be kind of a, a really bad situation. So an ear plug will help with that barrier. Uh, but you would have, uh, uh, if, you put, if you're welding like this, if I'm right-handed, I could put it over like my, uh, whatever ear is gonna be exposed with, depending on the angle of where I'm welding and I could help protect with that little brim on the hat over top of my ear. Um, uh, something else I wanna talk about when it comes to uh, PPE is the idea of a powered air purifying respirator. Uh, I, they, they make them, the first one I ever saw was a long time ago, they're not a new thing. And they're actually a welding helmet like this. And inside it has a respirator, kind of uh, the rubber for a respirator, a half mask. And it, it has a hose that goes over your shoulder and a lot of them have a power pack on the back uh, that you strap around your waist or whatever. And it's got a, it, ha it pulls air through there and it purifies the air. So it has a cartridge in there that purifies the air. And then it blows a continuous stream of air into your face. So when I have that welding smoke that's coming over me, like you've seen in that picture, 
it actually is blowing. I'm still getting fresh air blown straight in my face. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of equipment. It, it's a good investment. Um, I never had to, I never got in a situation. I was early. I got out, out of, off the tools essentially in 2010 kind of thing, uh, doing it as a profession. And, uh, I never, at that point, never bought one. If I was still working in the welding trade, I would guarantee it. I'd, I'd be owning one of those because of the, the aspect that I just want to live longer and healthier. And, and that is an, a great option because getting your face, little, keeping your face a little smoke in all reality is, is a great option using fans, all that stuff but you can't get your face out of all the smoke. Okay. Fire prevention. Flammable materials around the work area are the number one cause of fire. Uh, this can be prevented and, main, and by maintaining a clean working area before uh, proceeding to weld. It is also important to load the location of fire alarms, emergency exit, and fire extinguishers in the event of a fire. Uh, keep a suitable fire extinguisher around. Uh, that's kind of a funny picture, but not funny. I, I, I'm assuming it's a setup picture or photoshopped. Uh, but uh, seriously, if it, I, I've had my legs start on fire <laughs> from welding, you're just welding away and you smell something, a different type of smoke or whatever. And it's like a small fire, you pat it out. But having a fire extinguisher around making sure you're not throwing sparks at any flammable uh, uh, things like paper or wood or uh, gasoline, stuff like that is, is very important. Um, I won't talk too much uh, else on that. Training practices and procedures. Uh, oh, quick overview on this. If, if we buy something, if I'm a homeowner and I go buy something, like the manual has the information in it. Okay, so we want to read the manual. If it comes with safety devices, use those safety devices like a grinder. If it has a guard, use the guard. If it has a handle, use the handle, right? And, and practices and procedures uh, all, as well. A lot of our workplaces are going to have these developed. And what they are is they're going to give us an, uh, a tried, tested, and true way of doing the job. Okay, and, and that because it is a hazardous uh, atmosphere and environment when we're talking about welding. Um, so we're going to have to develop proper ways of doing it so that workers can consistently do it safely. Uh, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is actually get out of the PowerPoint now and, and chat with you guys a little bit. Um, is there any questions that the other advisors or, or that's came up in the Q and a that you, we'd like to chat about? I think you kind of, uh, you, you answered quite like, you know, the, the ones that were in there. Um, there was one question that it came up uh, that there's a U6 rating on my safety glasses. I understand that to be the highest rating for UV protection from normal eyewear. My question pertaining to that is that will, will that suffice as a protection to people working in the same shop as my welder? And correct me if I'm wrong on this, but like you had mentioned it when you talked about your face shield shade. Um, and yeah. generally speaking, a shade five, depending on the process. Now, that's that's the important part, right? Is it arc welding, gas welding, oxygen uh, cutting? Uh, it depends on the current, uh, the electrode size, the plate thickness, and the operation. All those things kind of come into effect. And there are charts available for, for the person that asked this question. There are some pretty detailed charts and, and doubling up that face protection. But uh, I worked in commercial carpentry for a long time. And one of the uh, big things, you know, when you're setting a big pair, of, big set of open pan stairs or, or uh, helping out the welder set up brick angle is, uh, hey, can you come over and hold this for me or, or whatever? And then, you know, you see someone holding it with one hand and they just do this, right, to protect yeah. themselves. Yeah. And, and that's no good, right? Because things happen where what if, what if the piece starts to slip and you need both hands and all of a sudden you're trying to grab on while not being exposed to that flash. Um, but like they asked in the Q&A, uh, you know, is the U6 rating on my sa safety glasses okay? And that is going to protect you from the radiation uh, for the most part. Um, that radiation with a, with a high radiation protection, that's going to help protect you. Um, but you definitely want uh, to avoid that bright, bright light as well. And that's where that shade protection comes in. So I've seen, Justin, where uh, uh, people say, I can handle it, right? Like, <laughs> 
your eye protection is not a is not an aspect of I can handle it. I'm pretty sure there's people out there that can handle staring at the sun as well. Doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Um, yeah, something like this exactly, Joanne. When we have uh, when you have workers standing around watching the process, a, a shaded pair of safety glasses may not let Justin very apt to answer there. It may not protect you from, it may not be to the, the level of shade that you need. It may be tolerable, but it doesn't mean you're not doing short-term or long-term damage to your eyes. Uh, you, what you want to do is actually get into it. I love that the, this helmer, this, this, this automatic helmet of mine, I can I use it for grinding or for welding. And I can, I can switch, I think, through shades 5 through 13 or 14 on it, which I can then therefore find the right shade. And, and let me tell you, depending on the process, like you said, Justin, the shade needed for any given process, it changes. When I do, if I'm doing like a, air arc gouging, which is a gouging process where you gouge steel out using uh, a high amperage uh, uh, off the welding machine and a high pressure air actually to throw the, to spit the, uh, the, the molten metal away. I, that's the darkest shade I use when I use that. I'm, I'm up to like a 13 on that because it's so violent and the, the light that comes off it is so violent and so bright. But if you get me into a MIG process, I can be down to a shade nine or 10 depending on the, the amperage and stuff, like you said. So really good question. Yeah, I brought this one up to um, also bring out that sometimes you're, you have additional hazards such as working at heights um, and using other equipment, aero work platforms um, and so forth. And Sunday, you know, I, I know you uh, you have a big background in uh, in the agricultural industry. Um, welding is a is a massive part of that. Um, you know, there's it's one of those things where it's the overhead overhead uh, processes, and you're underneath of things. In your experience, have you seen um, you know anything that's been a little over and above uh, with processes done in that industry versus the construction industry that you've seen so far? The agricultural, um, in the construction industry, I, I think we are following more closely the, the regulations and the safety precautions. Farming can get a little bit more removed from that and, and a lot more risk is taken in because you're on your own, you're doing it yourself and, and it's the old school, it's got to get done and it's got to get done now. So. Um, it's important to pay attention to those health hazards, uh, like what everything Mike has just talked about, um, from your eyes, your hearing, you only get one set. Um, Justin, I think I've seen you do done the, um, give the example, close, close one eye, hold your arms out to the side, and then see how, how, how much you actually see if you lose one eye. It's, it's, a, it's a good example, even it's great for kids uh, to demonstrate uh, the loss of yeah. one eye and how that can impact your your future oh well, for sure sunday uh, speaking of hearing protection uh, back to dual protection sometimes in in the welding industry you need two sets of hearing protection you need to get you need as the maximum hearing protection you can get because if you're inside of a tank and i've done this before i'm in a tank and i weld a clip on or something and then i'm like oh it's in the wrong spot so i tacked it on or whatever cut it off and i and i hit on the side of that tank the gong that's within a, a confined space like that or in, uh, when steel, the gong is such a high decibel mm -hmm. that without dual ear protection, like an ear plug with an ear muff over top or something like that, it's, uh, it, it's extremely, it, it can be dangerous even with a set of ear plugs and due to the, the sheer uh, volume. Right, and the damage yeah. over, can accumulate over time with that. So, and you, and you want to be able to go home and, and have that conversation with your, your loved ones and your kids and, and you want to be able to hear them. So that's, you know, that's more important why we're doing this. <laughs> You know, and it doesn't even need to be necessarily in a confined space either. That, that's the thing, like with welding, you're working with metal. Um, you know, I've come over to, uh, as, as a carpenter, going to, come over to check, you know, to make sure someone's installing a door frame on the line. And uh, right as I'm, you know, kind of looking at it, you get your head in the jam kind of, and then all of a sudden someone bangs it with a hammer or something like that to move it over. And just that sound that travels through that steel. Um, and that goes to say too, um, you know, when you're just working, not even just as a welder, 
but you're working around welding processes. Man, the, the amount of times that, uh, <laughs> you know, I had to, uh, for, for lack of better terms, check my shorts because I was working so close to welder when they, they go to bang steel. And I'm not talking with a chipping hammer, you know, I'm, you know, they're using a sledgehammer to move something over, bend steel in the right place, or, or they start grinding. As a welder and working around welders, you need to both be cognizant of each other's presence because, like you had said, sparks are going to get thrown 10, 15 feet. Um, you, you, you don't know, right? I mean, you all, you always have to be aware uh, of who's working around. That's where it comes down to that hazard assessment of not just what are the, the hazards that will be in my area now, but updating those hazard assessments because when you have people setting steel or welding, they're moving from spot to spot. And that spot at 8, 8 a.m., 7 a.m. might not be the same at 2 p.m. when the welders finally make it up to where you are uh, putting on that galvanized brick angle and the wind is just somehow perfectly blowing around that door frame into the spot you're working and everybody's saying what's that smell right so you know you really need to get that um, pay attention to what those hazards are and and know to update those assessments and change processes as needed i love that justin you talk about hazard assessments uh and, and the earplug thing earplugs are another standard piece of equipment in welding like it's a ppe you just wear it all the time uh but the hazard assessment it deals with, uh, what I love about hazard assessments is not the idea that I know something and I write it down. Great, you knew it before you wrote it down. It's the idea that everyone's on the same page and that the hazard assessments reviewed by all workers on the site. And being a young worker, when I was a young worker in the, in the field, there was new, like every day, man, there was things that people are like yelling at me and telling me, you know, why are you doing that? Because you don't know. But so common knowledge becomes common, I find through a hazard assessment process, really. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Mike, we are at the three minute mark. Um, is there anything else you want to, uh, we should cover before wrapping it up? I don't know. There, I got a lot of different tools in the shop and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think that we really need to get into that. I think we covered it a, a lot. Ergonomics, you're dealing with heavy steel. You got a lot of tools. Um, just learning from other people's experience. I think when it comes to any trade, learn, one of the greatest things to do or hardest things to do uh, in life, I think, is learning from other people's mistakes. And I, I really find that that talks like this and stuff like that is, is a, uh, it's accumulated knowledge of, of, of things that have gone wrong, right? Like the, these precautions and these ha the, 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 the control of hazards is, is in place for a reason. The reason is, is because it's life altering, uh, life changing when these hazards actually become harmful. So, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just wrap it up. Uh, anything else from you, from you guys? Um, I just like to say that the, uh, SESA online website, you can find more information on the exact regulations that you should be following, um, to help you with the, assessing those hazards and stuff. Um, so at SCSA Online, there is actually under the documents, uh, forms and legislations, we have the OHS guide. It's an app that you can download on your cellular device and you can go right into the regulations pertaining to welding. Uh, so it'd be worthy to check out, especially if you're a DYR, you're doing it at home, check it out. Um, more information is better. Yeah, so great. Anyone else? No, no I, uh, yeah. I think you said it all, Mike. <laughs> 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 oh yeah so uh wrapping up today's webinar i hope we've all i hope we've provided some useful information that can be a can be applied at work and, and maybe even at home uh, remember to take safety home professionalism and safety should be top of mind in all construction tasks uh not to mention our kids are watching and learning from our actions we can tell them wear safety glasses all day long but if Mom or dad doesn't wear safety glasses. They're learning from our actions. So um, thank you for joining us. Please uh, stay tuned for next week's webinar uh, Tuesday at noon. Have a great day.